Well, the Lord be with you. So today we're going to be starting a new series where we are going to be looking at the greatest sermon ever preached. And that is found in Matthew chapters 5 to 7. And today we're going to be looking at the introduction section of this sermon that is commonly known as the Beatitudes or the Eight Blessing Statements of Jesus. So just to give you a little bit of background, so Jesus has begun his ministry. He has gained some of his disciples, and he started to heal people of disease, of sickness, and he's starting to preach and teach the kingdom of heaven to the world, and there are many followers that are starting to crowd around, and they're starting to multiply, and as Jesus sees these crowds coming following him because of what he's been doing for them through the preaching, through the teaching, through the healing, he goes up to a mountain. And this is probably somewhere in Galilee, but he goes to a mountain. And then as he sees his disciples, those who are following him, probably more than just the 12, but a large group of disciples following Jesus to hear him, he sits down and he begins to preach this message. And why do we call it the greatest sermon ever preached? Well, I think it's the greatest sermon for one because it is preached by the one who knows all things, that is Jesus Christ. It's preached by our Lord and our Savior. So as we go through this series together, I want you just to remember every single word here is spoken by our Lord and our Savior. That is what we're going to be meditating on as we work through this together. What he is sharing with his, or from his soul, from his spirit to ours, is what we're going to see in these red letters as we go through this message. But it also, I think this message, the Sermon on the Mount, is so powerful because it speaks to all aspects of our life. It's going to discuss how we are to think of ourselves, how we are called to relate and think about our sin how we are called to think and relate towards one another, as well as how we are to relate to God. So it covers all aspects of our lives, all of our different types of relationships, interactions, but it also talks about what it means to be a part of the kingdom of heaven. And so we're going to see a description and an explanation of kingdom living, how it is to be a part of the kingdom, and also what does it mean to be a representative and to live within the kingdom standards. And so we're going to see this somewhat summarized in this um, section of Scripture today, Matthew 5, verses 1 to 12, as I said, known as the Beatitudes. And they are called the Beatitudes because it comes from the first word of each phrase, which starts with blessed or blessed. And that comes from a Greek word, makarios, which simply means to be blessed or actually to be happy. So what this is describing is saying, if you want to be someone who truly experiences the good life and obtains true happiness, true joy, true blessedness, then you are called to live in such a way. But whenever I'm talking about joy or happiness or or being blessed, I'm not talking about typically what you see with the world. See, the world will describe being blessed as being financially prosperous, having a lot of money or a lot of materials, or I might say that you're really, really healthy, so therefore you are blessed, or then you can be happy when you have all of these different things. But we're going to see that Jesus actually turns all of our expectations on its head. He has an upside-down kingdom where he's going to show that there is true joy found spiritually in the kingdom of heaven. And this true joy that he offers us, it transcends our emotions as well as our circumstances. Because the thing is, if you put all of your joy or happiness in your wealth, and if you lose it, it's gone. Right? If you put all of your joy in thinking that I'm blessed because I'm healthy or I'm active, Eventually, as we know, as we get older, that will go away. So if we place our joy or our hope in anything apart from what Christ gives us in this kingdom message, then we will see that our joy will fall away. But in the joy that Christ offers us to be blessed, it is something that lasts 
forever. And so that's what we're going to be looking at today as we look at each of these beatitude statements. One final thing before we go into each one at a time is that this is describing the character of those who are a part of Christ's kingdom. So whenever we say, blessed is someone because they something or because they are going to get something, we have to remember this is describing those who are followers of Christ. So as we look at each one of these, you are to examine yourself to examine your heart, to examine your life, and think to yourself, do I epitomize, do I encapture these characteristics? Because if not, I think it's a good thing for us to think about maybe I might not be following Christ. I might not be someone who has a heart for the Lord. And if that's you, I want to encourage you to surrender your heart today. I want you to surrender to the Lord because these blessings are available to anyone that wants them, but you have to receive Christ. And for us as Christians who are followers, let us hear what it means to be blessed. Let's let's hear what it means to live the good life and let us understand that it all comes from Christ. So that being said, we're going to be starting in verse 3 of chapter 5 where it says the first beatitude and it says, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? Well, to be poor in spirit is describing someone's recognition of their own spiritual state when in relation to a holy and a perfect God. To be poor in spirit is to recognize that when we look at God and his holiness, that we are unworthy of him. We are unworthy of his kingdom. We are sinners in need of a savior. So when we think about God and we think about our own spirituality, what it means to be poor in spirit is to say, I am spiritually and morally bankrupt. I have nothing to offer God. God doesn't need anything. There's nothing that I can give God that's going to make God better. He doesn't owe me anything. That is what it means to understand that we are poor in spirit. So I think what it means to be poor in spirit is to be open and honest with yourself. You have to be true to who you really are. Are. And I think we see this time and time again through some of these spiritual giants that we see throughout Scripture. When I think about the prophet Isaiah, when he has the vision of God on his throne, what does he say? He says, Woe is me. I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. Or when we think about Peter, whenever he sees Jesus perform this great miracle of the catching of fish, He falls down and he says, depart from me, O Lord, for I am a sinful man. That is what it means to be someone who is poor in spirit. When you see the glory, when you see the goodness of God, you recognize that you do not measure up. And that is all of us. None of us are worthy of the kingdom of heaven which then leads us then to fall completely and fully on the grace and the mercy of God. That's what poor in spirit is, is where we say, I can't do it, I can't earn it, I don't deserve it, but God offers it anyway. Poor in spirit is to fall on grace, fall on the mercies of God. But I think as we see, when we think about to be poor in spirit, we see how counter cultural it is. See, the world is not advocating to be poor in spirit. We always want to be wealthy in everything, right? We also think it's all about you, 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 or you are good, just just follow your heart, right? Or you can accomplish anything, it's all up to you. Or I was born this way, so you need to love me this way. But we're seeing here in this message is Jesus saying, You must be poor in spirit. That, no, being born this way, the way you're living your life, it's not all good. It's not okay. We must be born again, as we see in John 3. 
So to be poor in spirit is to recognize our spiritual condition, our sinfulness, fall on the mercy and the grace of God. Because here's the thing, it says the promise in verse 3 is, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And we'll see this at the very end of the last beatitude, which is an inclusio, which is saying the whole content, uh, the contents of all of this that we're seeing in these beatitudes are for those who are in the kingdom of heaven. So therefore, if you are not someone who is poor in spirit, you cannot obtain the kingdom of heaven. You must come to that spiritual realization. You must humble yourself before the Lord. And then for those that do it, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We see in verse 4, it says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. I find it interesting if we think about the word blessed being translated as happy, and then it literally says, happy are those who mourn, right? Happy are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. It seems almost, you know, a contradiction, right, in terms. But what I think the Lord is revealing to us here is that a natural progression or a logical progression from being poor in spirit is going to naturally lead us to mourn over our sin. See, to be someone who spiritually mourns is to recognize they are poor in spirit and then to have an attitude of repentance. So then not only are we, are we recognizing where we are at spiritually in relation to God, but we are also repentant. We have changed our mind. We have changed our attitude towards our sin to we have come to the point where we actually mourn and we groan over living a sinful life. Are you someone who is sorrowful for your sin? Or are you someone that always just is trying to cover it up? You're someone that's, you know, you're always trying to get an excuse or justify why you're doing this, X, Y, and Z. We must be someone who is repentant in our heart. We must mourn over our sin. Because if we do that, if we embrace the mourning, if we embrace the sorrow, we see that there's immediate joy that follows. See, the world isn't going to make you do this. The world isn't going to make you mourn. They're going to say, live your best life. It is your truth. It is your mission, your purpose in life. But what God says is he says, you must recognize you need to mourn over sin. And then you will truly find comfort. It says you will be comfort. So when we see our hopelessness in ourselves, we then can find comfort in our Savior. And that is what Jesus is saying. And you'll see this time and time again through this whole sermon. The whole point is Jesus to say, you got to do this. I can't do that. And that's why you have to turn to him. The whole message is to lead us to Jesus because we can't do it on our own. But whenever we recognize our sin, we mourn over our sin, Jesus then is going to comfort us. And there will be a day where there will no longer be any more sin, any more mourning or sorrow. All joy will follow those who mourn. In verse 5 we see, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. To be a Christian is to be someone who is meek. And to be someone who is meek is to be someone who is humble and is lowly in spirit. But it's one thing to just say, I'm humble, right? To say, I want to be humble. But it's a totally different thing to truly be humble. We need the leading and we need the grace of the Spirit of God to lead us into a place where we have become truly meek men and women. But to be humble, to be lowly in spirit, is to be someone who is self-controlled. To be free from malice and vengefulness. And I, I find it, as a meek person that is desiring to be a meek person, what we would want to do is no longer seek to glorify ourselves. See, once again, as we think about our culture, it's about Continuing to grow in yourself, build your own kingdom up, build your house, your family, your wealth. It's all about you, you, you. But to be meek is to recognize it's not about me. 
It's not about me. It's about the Lord. My life is about God. I have to humble myself before him. And as we see this logical, logical progression, if you recognize your poor in spirit, if you're mourning over your sin, then it results in someone who wants to be meek, who desires to be meek. But not only should we not seek to glorify ourselves, but we also need to no longer try to always defend ourselves. I think it's easier for Christians to think, well, yes, we can't glorify ourselves. We shouldn't be boasting about ourselves. We need to boast about the Lord. But then I think, how many times do we say that, but then immediately when someone may say something that's not representing me correctly or that might um, hinder my character in the eyes of some other people, do we immediately feel the need to respond, to argue, to defend ourselves? Think about Jesus, the most meek person in all of existence. Whenever he was on trial, he didn't argue. He didn't defend himself. He lived a life of meekness, a life of humility, and he allowed the world to respond accordingly. That is what it means to be meek, someone who will live a life for others, for the Lord, and does not seek to glorify themselves or defend themselves. However, it is important that we would note that meekness does not mean weakness. Sometimes we think, oh, you're a meek person because they never, they never argue about anything. They never stand up for truth. They don't ever have an opinion on anything. They just, they just want to go with the flow, right? They're kind of that person that really doesn't stand up for anything, doesn't really have any moral strength, any depth to them. That is not what it means to be meek. To be meek is someone that actually requires a great deal of moral strength. See, we all, it's the easy thing is to glorify ourselves. The easy thing is to argue and to defend ourselves. But it's something totally different to be someone that you could speak and you choose not to. You could act, but you understand that it would be wise not to. That's what it means to be meek. So what I think meekness is truly the discipline of is dying to self. Where Jesus says, if you want to follow me, you have to die to self or deny yourself and take up your cross daily. That is what it means to be meek. We must die to ourselves. We must die to our own desires. And we must submit to the will of the Lord. Because here's the thing. If you are someone who is meek, the promise in verse 5 is that you shall inherit the earth. I just love how Jesus does all these things. You would never expect these to follow. Because if you are someone that typically in our world, if you're aggressive, right? If you fight for things and you're always causing this conflict and you're trying to overcome and do these different things, then you're going to reign and rule. But what Jesus says, if you do the exact opposite, that is how you will not only be an enter or enter the kingdom of heaven, but you actually get to possess it. You get to actually rule and reign with Christ on the earth. In the eternal state, the earth will be ruled alongside Christ with his church. Christ and his family, the brothers and sisters of Christ, they get to rule and reign over the earth through living a meek life. Verse 6, we see, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Hunger and thirst, they describe a fundamental need that we as humans have. You can't go long without food or water. For a Christian, for someone who is a subject of the kingdom of God, they don't just hunger for food and water. What they ultimately are hungering and thirsting for is the righteousness of God. They desire, as they have looked to their spiritual condition, they have mourned over their sin. They have become self-disciplined and they are trying to die to self. What they then are looking towards is, I want to be filled with something. I've emptied myself of my own desires and I now want to be filled with the righteousness of God. This is a deep need for the believer. And I think this is a good test for those who are truly in the kingdom of heaven. 
Ask yourself, is this one of the greatest desires of your life? The greatest need of your life is I want true righteousness. In my entire life, that's what I want. I want to live a righteous life that honors the Lord, that honors those that I love and I surround myself with. I live a righteous life. Because here's the thing it says in the text, for those who hunger and thirst for it, that they shall be filled or satisfied. I think this speaks of two things, two realities. I think it speaks of an immediate reality for the believer. When we trust in Christ, when we accept him as our Lord and our Savior, we get the immediate effect of being filled with righteousness through the process known as justification. We're immediately, when we humble ourselves before God, when we say, God, I want your righteousness, I don't want my own, immediately at that moment, you are holy. You are made right in the eyes of God. Because of the blood of Christ that he shed, he makes you pure, white as snow. But I think it also describes a future event that will be a consummation of the kingdom of heaven, which is known as holiness or sanctification where though we are made right in the eyes of the lord today because of the blood and the sacrifice of christ through the power of the holy spirit that now indwells us we are going to continue to grow in holiness we're going to continue to become more and more christ-like so i think this then describes how we have this need for justification to be in a relationship with God, but I think it also describes the pursuit of holiness that we all are called to. Every day, we can't just lean on saying, I'm justified, therefore, I'm going to live however. We live a holy life because of the justification that Christ has offered us. So we are justified, and then we are becoming sanctified. We are becoming holy, and that is what it is to pursue and to hunger and thirst for righteousness. And that is what's so powerful. This is the essence of the gospel message, is that you will be filled. It doesn't say you might be filled. You will be satisfied in Christ, because he is the standard of true righteousness. As we go through the Sermon on the Mount, we'll see how Jesus is the only one who can complete and fulfill everything that is written in there. And he offers that righteousness, that perfection to us, to those in the kingdom of God. So you can be made right, you are righteous in the presence of God, but then you also are growing in righteousness as you live a holy life. And this is the essence of the gospel. In verse 7, we see, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. As we see time and time again throughout Scripture, God is a God of mercy. I love the Psalms, how it talks about how his mercy endures forever. The mercies of God are everlasting, and they are available to anyone that wants to possess them. But for those who have been filled and are pursuing holiness, and are pursuing righteousness, what they find is as they continue to strive after Christ, they continue to strive after God, they find this mercy, and it results then in them to continue to show and flow out that mercy to others. Because we, as followers of Christ, we become people of forgiving and compassionate spirits. When we understand the mercy of God, we want to show that mercy to others. Is that how you are living your life? When someone wrongs you, and you have every justification for calling them out on it, or holding them accountable, or judging them for that action, Do you take that opportunity to do so? Or do you take that opportunity to show the mercies of God? See, God offers mercy. And for those who are showing mercy, the promise is we will obtain mercy. So that means there's nothing 
in your life. There is no sin too great that will not be forgiven by God. That is how great his mercy really is. That is why it says it endures forever. It is everlasting. No matter what sin you are dealing with, whatever sin you will deal with, whatever is in your past, God offers mercy. God offers forgiveness. And we, as kingdom representatives, are called to go and do likewise. To forgive 70 times 7. Not a limited number to forgive, to show mercy to the world. Verse 8, we see, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Here we talk about the purity within oneself. As someone who is seeking righteousness, recognize their sinfulness, seeking to show mercy and obtain the mercies of God, It cultivates in oneself a pure heart. But I think what it means for to have a pure heart, it's more than just physical action. It is more than just obeying a law or obeying obeying a, a commandment. Because in some of these audiences that Christ is preaching and speaking to are religious leaders, Pharisees, that they thought that if they just did everything that the law said, And if they just did these certain actions, maybe for us, you just come in the pew, you sit down, you stand up, you sing the song, you hear the words, that therefore there is a relationship. But what Jesus is saying, to be pure in heart, not just through our actions. Now, actions are important, but it must flow from a pure heart who is focused on the greatest commandment which we spoke of last week, which is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your being, all of your strength. The inner self is to love the Lord. And so our heart must be desiring God above all else. And that's what it means to be pure in heart. And what is so powerful, I love this promise in verse 8. For those who are pure in heart, It says that they shall see God. That is something that Moses asked about in the Old Testament. That is something many of us have probably thought about. What it would be like to see God in all of his glory, all of his beauty, sitting on the throne, ruling with all of these angels, all of these creatures worshiping and bowing down to him. The promise for anyone who is pure in heart, is that they get to see that. You get to witness God in heaven. And that is a powerful promise that is given to those who are of the kingdom of God. Verse 9, we see, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Not only can we see God on the throne in his glory, his majesty. But we also, if we are someone who become peacemakers, we are going to be blessed by not only being able to see him, but be called sons and daughters of God. So you're not just seeing him from a distance like someone on a stage, a performer. You get to look at that person and say, that's my father. The God on the throne, the God of the universe, the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords is the Father of the children of God. Those who are a part of the kingdom of heaven. Those who are the peacemakers. You cannot be a follower of Christ and not be a peacemaker. Why? Well, Christ is the Prince of Peace. Jesus promoted peace advocated for peace. And then we, as his followers, his representatives, his children, we are called to be those who make peace. And I think it's interesting. It says we are to be peacemakers, not peacekeepers. See, keeping is a little bit easier because with keeping peace, what do you do? You just go into an environment that's already peaceful and don't mess things up, right? Right? which is still hard for some people. 
But what it means to be a peacemaker is to actually go into a hostile environment, a world that is not peaceful, and it says, and I want you to go and make peace. I want you to be a change agent. That's what it means to be a peacemaker, to be someone who will go into the world and engage it and promote peace. And I think we do this a couple of ways. I think we do it by living a Christ-like life. We do it by pursuing righteousness. We do it by demonstrating meekness and humility. I think we do what James 1.19 says. Be swift to hear. Be slow to speak and slow to wrath. Do you know how many disagreements would fall away? How many arguments, how much disagreements, all this distinction within the body of believers, within our neighbors, our coworkers, if we did these three things? Be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. That is what it means to be a peacemaker. But I also think it's so important that we remember, as Christians, we are also called to be bearers of the gospel message. And the gospel message is a gospel of peace. It is the good news of peace. It is saying that we can actually be at peace with God, our Father in heaven. Because of our sin, because of our our spiritual poverty, we are separated We aren't at peace. We are enemies of God, destined for hell. But what the gospel promises us, it says that because of what Christ did on the cross and through his resurrection, we are actually can be at peace with God. And so when we go into the world, we are called to share that with them. We share the peace of the gospel so then it it can allow peace within one another. We can truly love one another, serve one another, care for one another, but also so we can all become a part of this kingdom family. So to be a peacemaker is not only to live a life where you advocate for peace, but also where you share the gospel of peace. And because if we do that, we become the children of God. The last beatitude that we see is in verses 10 to 12. And if you notice, it'll say, bless it again after verse 10. But really, I believe these last few verses are summarizing and giving some more information about this final beatitude. And it says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. See, as Christ continues to share all of these many blessings that come with being a part of the kingdom of heaven, he ends it by saying, you will truly be blessed. You will truly be happy. You will truly be fulfilled with joy that is everlasting if you are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Think about that. You find joy in suffering. You find peace and blessedness in persecution. That is what we are seeing here. It is hard to understand and look at the scriptures where some will come away with and thinking that they will not be persecuted and be a follower of Christ. To be a follower of Christ is to be someone who will experience persecution in their life. Persecution comes with the territory of being a Christian. So if you are someone that says, man, I just want my life to be just so good. I want everything to be easy on this earth. Don't be a Christian. Do not be a follower of Christ. But if you want true joy, if you want to be truly blessed, that surpasses everything this world has to offer, then experience and endure persecution. Because you will be someone who will obtain the kingdom of heaven. And I find it so interesting as well that it says that the peacemakers are the ones who are being persecuted. We are called to be peacemakers, and it says if you pursue that, as you pursue righteousness, you will be persecuted for righteousness' sake. And then he adds, for my sake. See, I think this describes what John 3.20 says, how the darkness hates the light. Because it exposes them. 
It's not because we're being aggressive. It's not we're, we're trying to add controversy or trying to cause problems in people's lives. As you continue to live for Christ, as you continue to strive for righteousness, as you submit to kingdom living, what you're going to show the world is that you're different. You are set apart. You are holy. You are like Christ. You are like God. And the world hates that. They do not like that people look different, that they are set apart, that they're not like us. They're not following the cultural trend. They are set apart. They are living a life that is distinct. And the darkness hates it because then it really shows them their spiritual bankruptcy. They don't ever want to dwell on that. They don't cultivate that recognition of saying, I am spiritually poor. I am a sinner. They reject that notion. They don't even use the word sin anymore. That is their mentality. And this was what led to the darkness crucifying the light. Jesus was crucified because he was different. He was crucified because he promoted peace, righteousness, humility, sacrifice, love, service. That is why the darkness crucified Jesus. And I truly believe if Jesus was walking around in our culture today, he would be crucified again. And if we want to be like Christ, then we need to expect that. Don't think Jesus would be persecuted today and think that you are somehow going to get by without persecution. You can't be like Christ, be holy, and not be persecuted. We have to see that. We must be willing to endure it. And I think it, it describes that it can be different fashions. We're not all going to be, Lord willing, thrown in prison today or tomorrow. But we can see persecution through verbal assaults or violent physical assaults. We have brothers and sisters that are experiencing the physical violent assaults in other countries for what just saying you're a Christian, you could be killed or thrown in prison. We have some luxury, and some actually might think it might be a hindrance to our spirituality from the fact that we don't have that persecution at this point here. But we will see as you post online sharing Christ, as you speak to a co-worker, as you talk to a lost friend, you will see that there will be people that will revile you. They're going to mock you. They're going to think you're weak. They're going to think that you just believe in someone that is imaginary. You're trying to just give yourself some peace in this world. But we as followers of Christ, we as heirs of the kingdom, we understand that this is so much more than anything the world has to offer. And that is why Jesus ends this introduction to the Sermon on the Mount with this wonderful statement. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Not only are we called to endure or expect persecution as Christians, but we are actually called to rejoice throughout it, to be exceedingly glad, not just a little glad, to rejoice because we understand that we are doing it for Christ. When we are persecuted, we do it for the Lord and Savior of the universe. And when we do this, we show that we are evident, evidentially being a part of of the kingdom. And then it also says that we are like the prophets who are before us. If you want to be like the holy men and women throughout scripture, you're going to be someone who rejoices in persecution. You know that you are following some good acts before you. If you are seeing persecution, because that is exactly what happened to the, uh, the prophets and the apostles, the early church fathers, they all experienced persecution. But we can ultimately cling to the fact that it says we have a great reward waiting for us in heaven. There is a great reward that God is calling great. And he is saying that is available to anyone who wants to follow after Christ. Turn from their sins and trust in him as their Lord and Savior. And that is why 2 Corinthians 4.18 says this. It says that we are not to focus or to look at the things that are seen, but we are called to meditate and look towards the things that are unseen because the things that we see in this earth, they are transient. They're 
passing away. They will all die in decay. But the reward, the treasure that Christ offers us in his kingdom is forever. And that is why we can say time and time again as we look at these that we are blessed. If you are in Christ, you are blessed. And that is something for us to always rejoice and be exceedingly glad in. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this time to engage your word and to start the greatest sermon ever preached where Jesus Christ came to a mountaintop and told us about the kingdom of heaven, how we can be a part of it, how we can be blessed through it, and how we can obtain a personal relationship with the King of glory. I pray that we would hear this message, we would apply it to our lives, and that we would seek you out, that we would live a life that glorifies the King, and that would be truly blessed for ourselves and for the world. We love you, we thank you, in Jesus' name. Amen.